Hello, and welcome to this online information meeting for FORSA members. My name is Una Faulkner. I'm Assistant General Secretary in the Civil Service Division of FORSA Trade Union. We are here today to discuss the Public Service Pay Agreement 2024 to 2026. On the 30th of January of this year, the NEC, which is our National Executive Committee, met and unanimously recommended acceptance of the deal. Our General Secretary, Kevin Canlan, led these negotiations as Chair of the ICTU Public Services Committee, and we'll be able to hear his perspective on the agreement shortly. Now, it's over to you. As FORSA members, you decide whether this deal is accepted or rejected. The ballot opened yesterday, Monday, the 19th of February, and runs until Friday, the 15th of March. It is an online ballot, and you will have received your unique voter code by email. Regarding today's information session, Kevin will give a couple of opening remarks in a few minutes, and then it'll be over to Eamon Donnelly, who is head of division. We'll be then over to you for any questions that you may have, and you submit these questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. We also have our Director of Membership, Sean McElhenney, who is here for any questions you might have on how to vote and way to vote. The session will be recorded and circulated to members, but now it is over to Kevin. Thanks, Una, and thanks everyone for making the time to join this webinar today. Uh, I want to use the opportunity to share with you what's been happening over the last number of months in negotiations and the issues that arose and how we try to deal with them. The first thing I want to say is that a public service agreement provides an opportunity for us to raise uh, issues with the government side. Uh, but in doing so, it's really important that we focus on key priorities. There's nothing more that than the Department of Public Expenditure officials would like uh, other than for us to have a long, long list of issues, because if we do, we have no real focus and no real priorities. And they simply will use that to uh, dilute, I suppose, uh, how successful we can be on the main issues. So for FORSA, where we started uh, in relation to this particular negotiation was in April last year. Many of you will recall that we had a major uh, survey of FORSA members conducted for us by Amoric Research and a staggering more than 20,000 uh, FORSA members completed a quite a detailed questionnaire, which included seeking what uh, their attitude was to various issues in the forthcoming uh, public service pay negotiations. Top of the list by a long, long way was cost of living, so much so that 99% of members uh, saw that as important. In fact, 83% saw it as very important. And we tried to uh, work that then into the priorities that our union set for the negotiations when it met on the 27th of September. That day, our national executive agreed four priorities for the negotiation. As I say, top of the list was... Um, cost of living, and in particular, how it affected low to middle income earners. Secondly, normalizing industrial relations within the public service, which really had been changed by the financial emergency and the legislation that was enacted at the time. Thirdly, arrangements to stabilize any agreement that might be made by uh, having provision for bargaining beyond the blanket restriction on cost increasing claims that has been a feature of agreements for uh, many years now. And finally, we wanted to future proof public services by introducing ideas that we had on the union side into the negotiation in a way that hadn't really been done before or certainly for many, many years. So just in relation to pay, um, I'm not going to go into every uh, turn and twist in relation to this because many of you will have been following it on our own media or even in the uh, mainstream media. But negotiations commenced at the Workplace Relations Commission on the 27th of November. The first couple of weeks were really spent trying to see could we get a commitment from the government in relation to um, repealing uh, the FEMPI Act. I'll talk about that a little later. When we got that breakthrough, it moved on to some of the other issues, but pay wasn't addressed even right up to Christmas week. And you may recall then 
talks broke up without pay having been addressed and where we had made a strong case for the talks to continue that week, even if necessary after Christmas, to try and put in place a deal by the new year when the uh, last deal, Building Momentum, expired. Uh, that didn't prove possible. We then decided that the Public Services Committee, which I chair, representing 19 separate unions, uh, and we were representing their interests in the talks. The talks in, were led by myself and my fellow officers, the other three officers, on behalf of all of the 19 unions. And that's the way it had operated in building momentum at the height of COVID. Prior to that, you know, lots of union officials from all of the unions would be involved in this uh, particular exercise. But the other side of that was that lots of people from the management side uh, in various sectors would also be involved. And uh, I think in practice, we found that that meant that they thought up a lot of uh, unpalatable proposals that had to be negotiated away before we really got down to the business of pay. On this occasion, we still hadn't reached pay uh, by Christmas. And in fact, when negotiations resumed on the 10th of January, uh, we eventually had a proposal for them uh, on pay, which I can only um, describe as I did on that evening that we got it as an insult if it was a serious proposal. They improved it a few hours later, but still we hadn't, um, we had a major gap between the two sides uh, in the early hours of the morning of the 11th of January when uh, talks adjourned. They recommenced on the 26th of January and at around 4 a.m. on the morning of the 27th of January, we finalized pay terms, but there was still a number of other issues outstanding that had to be um, resolved. And it wasn't until about a quarter to nine that Friday morning that we uh, closed out a deal. So I want to just talk about the pay situation for a start. We know if you look at the increases under building momentum, that for the vast majority of people, they got, you know, this isn't a cumulative figure, but just adding up the various percentages, nine and a half percent. That includes the sectoral bargaining fund, 1%, which most people got as a pay increase. And we know from our own uh, evidence and our own advisors in the Nevin Economic Research Institute, which we fund as trade unions, that inflation for that three-year period of building momentum depends on what measure you use, but the most commonly used ones are the CPI or the harmonized index, somewhere between 16.5% and 17.5%. So clearly there was a big gap. Uh, the government, of course, would say that they had taken other measures, including measures in the budget, to try and lessen the effect of the cost of living crisis, you know, so most notably, I suppose, the energy credit, which has been applied for the last two years or two winters, uh, and which has been significant. But equally, we know that that is very unlikely to uh, obtain next year as prices have started to fall. Of course, they'd also refer to the changes in personal taxation that have been introduced in budget 2023 and in budget 2024. Now, taken together, that probably represents an increase of a, between 2 and 4% in take-home pay, with the lower figure applying to lower earners, simply because they don't pay enough tax to fully benefit from uh, the changes in the tax bans. So it was reasonable to say, not just for public servants, but for workers in the economy, that those issues needed to be at least factored in. Nonetheless, there was a significant gap that we were saying needed to be addressed in terms of the shortfall over the last couple of years. The employer side didn't want to deal with that whatsoever. We had to keep forcing that onto the table in the talks process. And of course, we also needed to look ahead at the projections for prices over the period of any agreement. As it turned out, the duration of the proposed agreement is 30 months or two and a half years. And we know from the various institutions and the forecasters that inflation is expected to be in the range of six to six and a half percent uh, for that period. And that would be confirmed by our own advisors in the Nevin uh, Institute. Of course, nobody really knows. We don't we don't know for sure. 
how it's going to uh, turn out. But that's the best uh, information and advice at this stage. So when we um, resumed the negotiations, the ultimate um, outcome was a nine and a quarter percent um, increase, cumulatively a little bit more than that, uh, phased in starting from the 1st of January gone and uh, over the next uh, two and a half year period. Uh, of course, <clears throat> just like in building momentum, we wanted to do more for the lower paid. And I'm glad to say on this occasion, you know, many of the increases have a floor amount, which means that people who earn less than 50,000 will do a bit better. And the lower you earn below 50,000, the better you will do in percentage terms. Uh, and that's something that I'm particularly proud of because um, I'm over 40, 40 years, a union member, a union activist and a union official. And it was always something that we wanted to um, achieve and see more of more flat rate increases. And while from time to time they were a feature of agreements, they were never as uh, prominent an element of an agreement as they are on this occasion. So uh, looking at it in the round when our national executive met to look at the proposed agreement in relation to pay, they felt that over the two and a half year period, if uh, prices turn out as uh, forecasters expect them to at the moment, that there will have been a good recovery in incomes um, in terms of the losses that have been experienced in 2022 and 2023. And for uh, people on lower incomes taken as a whole, looking at the building momentum agreement and this uh, current proposal that there would be real increases in, in, in real wages for people on low incomes. So it was felt that it was a good outcome. Turning to normalization of industrial relations, um, as I mentioned, our own legal advice was to seek a repeal of uh, Section 4 of the FEMPI No. 2 Act 2009. Uh, in the event, what the minister committed to was repeal Section uh, 4, subsection 2 of that. Um, to be honest, we need to see exactly what legislative mechanism that they will use in order to do that. But we're taking some comfort from the fact that the minister repeatedly drew attention especially prior to Christmas when the talks broke up without agreement and we were talking about uh, seeking an industrial action mandate, he drew attention to the fact that he saw this as a big concession on his part. But in truth, we'll have to wait and monitor that very uh, carefully and hold him and the government to account in relation to, to that. More promisingly, I think we also have a simplified industrial um relations procedure with a clearer role for the Workplace Relations Commission and the Labour Court, and in this case of the civil service for the conciliation and arbitration schemes. So we think that will make it simpler if the agreement is accepted to deal with issues that come up. A big objective for us, and this goes back to the review of building momentum that was carried out in August of 2022, was to get away from this blanket restriction on cost increase in claims other than the pay terms provided for in the agreement. And we saw that as being done through local bargaining. Now, I want to try and explain this carefully because there is a bit of confusion. It's local bargaining as distinct from the pay terms, the national pay terms in the proposed agreement. And it's not local bargaining office by office or department by department, I think we would see it as still national categories bargaining. And importantly, it's while we've used in some cases a 1% increase for illustrative purposes, it's a 3% clause of which 1% of the cost is payable during the lifetime of this agreement. So we need to approach it on the basis of looking at things that might fall within a 3% costing uh, in terms of changes that we might want to make to gradings or structures or lengths of scales or whatever. And if the agreement is ratified, it's our intention to engage in a massive consultative exercise uh, as to how we would take that particular clause forward. And rather than just see it as a 1% increase, because 
the employers would probably be happy if we did that uh, because they're only really concerned about cost. We need to see it as 3% of cost plus if there are savings and productivities to be achieved that we want a share of that too. And the employers, you know, sought to exclude savings and productivity from the clause and we uh, succeeded in having that removed. So I think this is for the first time in many years, an exciting opportunity for us to engage with members about their issues and their priorities and to see how we will take that forward in the uh, months and year ahead if the agreement is ratified. Finally, on uh, future-proofing public services, and more disappointingly, we were rebuffed time after time in relation to things that we wanted to see as part of an agreement. We didn't see them as involving cost, at least in the short term, but uh, measures that would address things like the um, difficulty that workers have now in relation to housing, particularly in the cities, certainly in Dublin, but other cities too. And we wanted to create a forum where we would engage in relation to that and come up with real solutions to try and address the problem. We also wanted to have a forum where we would look at international developments in relation to insourcing and remunicipalization, something that where we've seen a shift away from outsourcing and privatization in recent years and to try and get that. Of course, they didn't want to do that either. Uh, and indeed, other things in relation to more flexible working, particularly aimed at trying to increase the number of women in the workforce uh, and so on. They saw these things as outside the scope of an agreement. So we're going to have to try and find other mechanisms to pursue those issues, including through the Labour Employer Economic Forum. Uh, I think that was a missed opportunity. And I suppose it shows, in a way, the fact that since the crash in 2009, we're no longer dealing with social partnership agreements that apply across the economy. We're just dealing with public service agreements. And as far as the employers are concerned, they see those as much narrower in scope. And really, they just see them about cost control. I think we all know that when we know, referring back to the normalization, we know that deeper really want to maintain the kind of control that they've enjoyed as a result of the legislative changes that were introduced from 2009 and very reluctant to to let that go. But I think we've we've started to um, prize that open, at least in in these uh, in this proposed agreement. Finally, it just, you know, on both Normalization and stabilization, I think, our executive were of the view that good progress had been made. Uh, they shared the disappointment I had in relation to future proofing public services, but felt that the change proposals that are in the agreement, by and large, are uh, things that we'll have to deal with anyway, even if there wasn't an agreement and that we're probably on balance better to have uh, the structure of an agreement to deal with them. In many cases, we had um, changed the initial language in negotiation anyway to include consultation and in some cases agreement as part of um, the individual proposals. The Just to be clear, their approach to the transformation agenda was heavily informed by the Department of Public Expenditure's own strategy document, which um, Better Public Services, which was published last year. So... Um, as Una said, the executive, having had a long discussion, long presentation, longer than this for myself, um, uh, decided unanimously to uh, put the proposals to ballot with a re recommendation for acceptance. So I just have one, you might be surprised at this, one request of you and your colleagues, and it isn't to vote in favour of the agreement, it's just to vote. One of the things that I think has worked well for Forza over the last few years is being able to demonstrate that we're speaking for our members in their tens of thousands. Whether we use the survey process, which I think I use to good effect both for the building momentum agreement, which helped us get the hours back, and on this occasion to... Um, indicate the extent to which cost of living was affecting people. I've shared key elements of that data with all of the political parties, in fact. And, you know, the other thing that we've 
done effectively both on the building momentum vote, the review of building momentum, and I hope on this occasion, is to give the government and the minister not a percentage figure of what the force of decision is, but actual numbers who voted. And I know Sean will talk about this later. So the more people we can get to vote, whatever way you vote, uh, the stronger our response and mandate is. So please um, do your best to get the vote out. Uh, thanks again for joining. And I'm happy to address any questions that come up. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we'll cross over now to Eamon Donnelly, who's head of the Civil Service Division, and then we will address the Q&As that have been coming in. Thanks, Una. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, I just want to, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat anything Kevin said. I just want to maybe touch on some sectoral specific uh, uh, references. So, the main references in the uh, in the proposed agreement are around artificial intelligence and cooperation with uh, digitalization and um, uh, hot desking and um, expansive use of shared services. Now, they're all things that uh, carry their own dangers, as we know, um, but that we need to be across. But um, they're not new. In fact. All of those were contained in the building momentum uh, sectoral action plans for the civil service. The key is that um, we continue to uh, make sure that the relevant departments uh, strictly observe the consultation processes that are required uh, under the agreement. And um, that leads me into the next piece, which is, and I saw something on the Q&A there, um, what happens when they don't and we end up in dispute? Because quite frankly, one of the big letdowns uh, of the conciliation and arbitration scheme has its has been its inagility in dealing with trade disputes. Um, because quite frankly, and anybody who's heard me at conference uh, or or in various consultative fora would know that I believe that the uh, conciliation and arbitration scheme, as it presents itself currently, uh, is broken and is not capable of providing uh, an agile industrial relations system. So what have we been doing about that? Our position was clearly to uh, get access to the WRC. Uh, and when we presented that as a position, uh, the uh, line that was put forward by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform was that a legislative change would be required uh, on around the definition of a worker in so far as how that presents uh, in the civil service. Um, I don't really accept that, um, but that's not important because that's their position. So the option uh, is then to get into a legal wrangle uh, about whether a, le a legislative uh, change is required. That could take some considerable time. I did successfully uh, manage to extract uh, a more honest position from uh, Deeper last summer. Uh, in July, when they actually um, said, well, look, they weren't really as amenable to access to the WRC for civil servants as they had uh, presented. So what happens then? So the proposal uh, that I put to them was that um, if you don't want to give us access to the WRC, well, then let's bring the WRC into the, in, into the scheme and let's reconstruct the CNA scheme to be as agile and efficient and fair as the, as the schemes uh, um, within the WRC auspices um, that every other public servant um, has use of. Um, we have gone a fair way with that now. In fact, only yesterday, uh, on behalf of the staff panel of civil service unions, I presented a model uh, to Deeper, uh, and I need to know um, if they are in favour of that model. And that model very much replicates uh the, the WRC model and involves WRC personnel uh coming in to assist uh, the CNA scheme and it has dispute resolution procedures um for trade disputes which just currently don't exist at the moment so um it'll be a, a, the, the big question now is um whether deeper say yes they're prepared to go with that model if they if they are I think it's something that would be a significant achievement and would result in proper uh, and fair dispute resolution procedures. If they're not, well, then we've got to consider 
uh, um, where we stand on all of that. Um, um, but I, I, I get a sense that, um, um, that we that we can crack that. Um, just on the uh, Kevin referenced the local bargaining uh, uh, clause and how it gives us a great opportunity to, um, to be of real relevance to our grades groups and categories, and that's very much in line with the civil service divisional strategy on recruitment and organising. Um, happily, our um, recruitment numbers are on a w very welcome upward swing, but we've really got to get out and be relevant to uh, the, the grades, groups and categories within the civil service. And um, as I said, uh, you'll be hearing a lot more of that um, um, over the next uh, few months. I just want to also mention um, one other thing, and that's working time, um, because working time was part of the sector election plan and, you know, uh, flexible working time. The, the, the flexi time accrual issue um, is on its way to arbitration. Error statement has gone in. Um, but more importantly, the um, WRC Code of Practice uh, following the piece of legislation on the right to request flexible working arrangements and the right to request remote working landed yesterday. And what that means is that um, the, the framework agreement on blended working in the civil service will now have to be adjusted to be complicit with that code of practice. It's a very long code of practice. Uh, it's a piece of work for me later on today. Um, as I said, it only landed yesterday. So I just wanted to touch on those points um, from a, a sexual point of view. Uh, Una, thanks. Thank you very much, Eamon. I'm going to lead over now to some Q&As and we've actually had a considerable amount in and more coming in. So we are trying to group them together, myself and the communications team. But just to probably start us off, um, a number of them that hopefully Kevin here can address is a section a question on section five of the agreement. It mandates compliance with the policing policy. How does this align with the union's work gaining access to the WRC for guard staff? And an additional question will be regarding the aspects of FEMP and what could remain primarily kind of addressing the ASC um, and I'll ask for those questions first. And then we're trying to group the rest of the questions. So if you could address those first, please, Kevin, thanks. Yeah, and there's a few others I think I'm I'm seeing that I'll try and kind of dispense with uh, fairly quickly. Just I'm not probably the best person in relation to the policing bill, but appended to the proposed agreement, just like in the case of building momentum, is a whole set of sectoral strategies and objectives. So they're the things that we're facing within uh, sectors and within government departments anyway. So um, I, I'm not sure that it goes beyond what we were already uh, dealing with. I know um, somebody has raised the issue of the no strike clause. And just to be clear, I can't recall any agreement over the last 40 years that didn't have uh, a no strike clause. So I think um, it's unrealistic to expect that the government are going to enter into a pay agreement with us that doesn't have that kind of commitment. Um, there were a couple of people have raised the position of retired uh, members. So I pursue this in the talks and we have a commitment that, um, well, I should make the distinction between people who are um, pre-2013 and the single scheme whose uh, pension will continue to be linked to the serving staff. So the government have confirmed that they will apply the increases to pensioners in that situation. For people in the single scheme, uh, pensions are adjusted by um, CPI anyway, so they're in a different situation. There was an interesting question. I think this, this is really important to, to get this across. When we talk about uh, repealing FEMPI, and again, to just answer one of the questions, we're going to have to wait and see exactly uh, how that's going to be done. Perhaps the, the questioner wasn't online when I said that. We're you know, we won't know for sure. All we can go on is that they've made a big deal out of the fact that they're going to do it. They've said it's a concession. Uh, that will change the ground rules going forward. But things that were done under FEMPI won't be undone. And I see one question relates to the ASC. And that that additional superannuation contribution was agreed under the 
public service stability agreement, which was voted in in 2017. And that was agreed in exchange for the pension levy, but it, it, it was agreed in order to protect public service pensions, which are under serious threat. I mean, we see this from time to time, including in early January. So just to be clear, repealing FEMPI won't automatically undo things that were done or introduced under FEMPI. You know, that that's an important um, point to make. Um, and just I think there was one other thing, just, uh, yeah, a point in relation to local bargaining. I know I've referred to the equivalent grades, which obviously will be an important vehicle for clerical administrative grades in all of the sectors, including, in you know, for COs, EOs, HEOs, etc. in the civil service. But clearly there are also a lot of technical, professional or specialist grades. Every single, we the first job will be to identify the bargaining groups and, you know, that's that's the first job we'll have to do. And obviously that's a massive uh, exercise in itself for a union like Forza that represents, you know, quite a considerable amount of grades. But not beyond us, we've had to do it before. You know, for example, um, in the benchmarking processes in the noughties and indeed prior to that in the local bargaining clause that uh, existed really right throughout the 90s. Um, a question that's come in just regarding local bargaining, will it be done grade by grade, department by department? Like how, how would the union be approaching that? It will be done nationally. So I think it will be it won't be done department by in my view, we would be crazy to do it department by department. I think we should try and come up with a national approach to that that gets consensus around what the main issues are for people working in grades. You know, do we want to consider shorter scales or whatever we might want to do? You know, they're, they're the questions we need to spend a bit of time consulting with people on if this agreement is accepted. I see also a, a question on outsourcing. Everything in the agreement is um, at least as good as what was in the previous agreement in relation to outsourcing. In fact, we achieved... Um, the inclusion of early consultation in relation to service plans to get us in early in the conversation. The fact of the matter is that's on us. We need to get involved in those discussions earlier than we have been doing. Uh, as I was very honest about, uh, we would have liked to have uh, had more commitments in relation to insourcing and so on. Uh, they were rebuffed. Just to be clear, uh, unit labour costs continue to be excluded from outsourcing and uh, consideration. So that's important from our point of view. Eamon just wants to come in there, Eamon. Yeah, I just see one question, Una, on the local bargaining in terms of grades who are kind of outside of the FORSA equivalent grades structure. So, you know, um, a lot of those would be professional and technical grades, and we're working uh, fairly intensely at the moment uh, to have the uh, national professional and technical uh, grades linked in uh, with, uh, in the equivalent grade family. And, you know, it's a question of uh, consulting with all these grades, seeing where they fit into the structure. Uh, if they don't fit into a structure, that doesn't preclude us from having a local bargaining uh, uh, claim. So um, um, we'll develop that a bit more um, in consultation with branches as we roll out. Thank you, Eamon. There's another couple of questions that have been just regarding if inflation skyrockets again is there a clause within the agreement that we can go back in to renegotiate um or vice versa yeah the exact same clause is in this agreement as the previous agreement the one we used to initiate a review when i called for that on the 11th of march uh 2022 but i think it's only fair to point out that given that the pay terms on offer over the two and a half year period are significantly ahead of projected inflation. I think it's reasonable to assume uh, that the government would have to be uh, persuaded that uh, things had changed, you know, quite fundamentally. But we do have the review clause and somebody else has pointed to the duration of the agreement at two yeah. and a half years. And um, yes, yeah, these things go. Um, well, it's a kind of probably a little shorter than most of the agreements we've had over the last few decades, but 
in a, an uncertain world, nobody, uh, the questioner is right to point out that nobody really knows for sure. That's why the review clause is important. Would we, if it was rejected, would we negotiate for a shorter agreement? I think, you know, we would have, if this multi-annual agreement hadn't uh, been possible, I think we would have pushed for a one-year agreement. However, it's impossible to judge how the government would have reacted to that. And I can tell you that they uh, were adamant that they weren't going to be brought beyond 4% this year and getting them to four and a quarter was very much a, we did not leave anything on the table in this negotiation. And I think the important thing that members need to understand is, you know, we weren't, in my view, going to improve on those terms in negotiation, more negotiation at this point in time. Um, two other questions just regarding pay is regarding allowances that were abolished under FEMPI or, or CUT. Um, as well as if someone retires this year, will they receive all the pay increases? Will the pay increase be reflected in their lump sum? Yeah, the, the normal arrangements will apply that your lump sum would be calculated based on the rate of pay at the time of retirement. And then, as I mentioned earlier, pensions would be adjusted in line with uh, the pay increases if somebody's in the pre-2013 scheme. Um, and what was the other part, Una? The um, if someone retires at the allowances. So. Oh, the allowances. Yeah, no, well, things that were, as I say, things that were done under FEMPI pertain right across in all sectors. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, some of these things won't be selected by bargaining units as things they want to address through local bargaining. But uh, that is really you know, that depends really on the issue and whether or not it's a sufficient priority. Um, this will probably be more for Eamon is regarding the, the Garda bill and when that policing bill potentially could come in, if you can answer that in any way possible. Well, it was due to take effect this year, but it's it's, it's not specifically dated at the moment. But um, just to explain where we are with that, I mean, um, it's it's going to be a piece of legislation. So we don't have kind of discretion around that, that the legislation would be the legislation. But we have managed to uh, secure a negotiating forum in terms of how that's going to affect uh, our grades of staff within the Garda. And the, the, the other question, Una, was around how would that affect um, our access to the WRC? Well, I've kind of covered that in my earlier. Mm -hmm. So uh, our official, Jim Mitchell, um, uh, just recently secured uh, a negotiating process for our grade. So again, uh, and we're in quite heavy consultation with the branches on that at the moment. Um, another question that's just coming in here is regarding technology and automation. Can we argue for decision support systems and in-person services under the agreement? Oh, I, 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 I know, I know, uh, I, I know where that's coming from, and I agree with it. Um, um, it came up last Friday at a meeting I was at. Um, uh, yeah, the, I mean, look. All I say to you is this, um, there is a commitment to cooperate with initiatives on artificial intelligence and digitalization. That doesn't mean everything becomes that way. So there, 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 are, there are debates and discussions which need to take place around the value of in-person services, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the government has a framework uh, connecting government 2030, and the reference in the agreement is to cooperation with that particular framework. But that that doesn't preclude us from um, having room to um, make sure that if we're delivering excellent public services, that in-person delivery is not a central part of it. Another another question here is um, and a, and a member who's had an ongoing pay issue with Deeper. And is there scope for agreement to rectify an error in a circular? I'd say this could be relation into uh, incremental credit. Um, I know that's been long been on the agenda for the civil service division. So, well, yeah, at the last general council, we were invited to um to write to deeper um surprisingly, uh to reconstitute the general council subcommittee of uh, uh on incremental credit. So that's in the pipeline at the moment, isn't it? Um, we'll be coming into the last couple of questions now. Is there any work being done with moving IT specialist grade to professional and technical as we are struggling to hire IT specialists currently? Yeah, well, specialized questions. Yeah, and I think I think Cahill was 
trying to clarify his earlier point there, which I, I get fully. Like, this is an issue in all sectors for administrative staff. So, you know, that's something that can be looked at uh, through local bargaining. But it's a matter of then deciding what whether that's addressed as part of a bigger bargaining unit or whether or not we try and uh, or should separate out some specialist people. But that's actually that was a very conversation I had with the National Secretary for our health division at eight o'clock this morning. OK, that's all I'm seeing coming in now, just waiting for communications. I know there's a couple of questions just going to be for Sean McElhenney, who's our director of membership. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Final question, Kevin. Um, was there any discussion on the tax credit for union subs? No, simply because, you know, that's an issue appropriate to all workers. So we deal with that through Congress. I wrote to the Minister for Finance uh, before the budget. We've raised it at the Labour Employer Economic Forum, and we intend to major on it this year as best we can, uh, given that the adequate minimum wage directive has to be transposed into law by November, and that uh, involves uh, promoting collective bargaining coverage. So we think that that's a good time to get across our message in relation to tax relief and union subscriptions. But the simple answer is, you know, it applies to all workers, not just public servants. So it wouldn't be appropriate to this particular negotiation. Thanks uh, very much, Kevin, and to Eamon. I'm going to hand over now to Sean McElhenney, who's our Director of Membership, who's going to, um, if you haven't already received your um, unique voter code, he'll explain how to vote, when to vote, I understand it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, but one question that did come in just regarding voting, Sean, is regarding a retired member um, who obviously has retired from the civil service but is still a member of the union. Do they get a vote? Okay, I'm going to come to that in two seconds. Thanks very much, Una. Uh, and thanks to all our colleagues who've joined us in a call over this lunchtime. This is the largest ever mobilization for Forza and an online ballot. More than 75,000 of our members in the public sector are involved in the constituency this year. It's our third national ballot that we've held online, the first being in 2021 during COVID, uh, when we had a constituency of 67,527 members. The second national online ballot was in 2022, and by then our constituency had grown to 69,000 943 members. So up to 75,000 members this year. It's a massive uh, undertaking to achieve the type of participation that we've achieved in the past. In 2021, it was 58% of our members. And the last uh, ballot in 2022, it was 67.5%. All members, and Una, hopefully this will answer the que our colleague's question, all members currently employed in the civil and public sector and non-commercial state agencies are entitled to vote. Unfortunately, our retired members are not entitled to vote because they're not employed in those organisations. Uh, so far, in the first 24 hours of voting, more than 20,000 members have cast their vote, and that means participation is already at about 25 or 26 percent nationally. But in the civil service division, we're leading the charge. Over a third, more than one in three members of the whole division have already cast their votes. And this high turnout follows a pattern of high participation during the pre-mobilization exercise that we ran in January. The pre-mobilization, uh, colleagues will remember, was the prize draw, and we asked members to let us know if they were receiving our emails and if they were ready for a vote. And more than 26,000 members responded in just a week. From the Revenue Commissioner's Executive Grade branch, half of all the members eligible to vote put their hand up and says, I am ready for, for the ballot. The DSP executive grade state, 46% participation, revenue clerical, 47%. And those patterns were sustained right across the civil service division, looking at the Dublin central clerical branch, uh, finance, power and associated orgs. I know Cahill Kelly's in the call, good man. Uh, then SSO branch, the justice and executive grades branch, the agriculture, food and marines, right across the civil service, really high participation, both in the pre-mobilization and in the ballot so far. And I believe that that reflects just how relevant this ballot is for our members. When the General Secretary talks about the value of this deal being 2.6 billion, that's not an economically abstract thing. For most of our members, that's the money to pay for school uniforms, nutritious meals, and to keep warm homes. And in the context 
of the high participation of members in the civil service division and the relevance of this proposed payday. I'm asking everyone on this call, the hundreds of people on this call, uh, to keep one question on the tip of their tongue over the next few weeks. Have you voted yet? Ask your co-workers when you leave this meeting today, when you go to work tomorrow, the next time you're in the office, ask those around you, have you voted yet? I can't overstate the significance of that small contributory action to the bigger campaign. We have hundreds of members in this call, and if everyone is to undertake that uh, undertake that action, I think it's realistic to expect that the civil service division will achieve more than 70% participation. Uh, and whatever the outcome, right, whatever the outcome of the ballot, the collective strength of our voice in this division will give a great deal of credibility to our union negotiators as they either close out this deal or move on to future negotiations. So it's really, really important to cast your vote. And how do we do that? So I want to quickly just talk about the process. The first thing that we do in Forza is we set up a constituency. And the constituency, as I've already said, is paid up members in the civil and public sector and non-commercial state agencies. And those colleagues are eligible for a vote. We then issue UVCs, which we did yesterday afternoon, and most people hopefully in this call by now should have received their UVCs. We issue it to all members for whom we hold an email address, and we have 96% email address coverage on the membership system. So for the vast majority of colleagues, they should have already received their UVCs in their mailbox, and they'll be able to cast their vote without an issue. However, around one in 10 members couldn't count on an issue. It might be that we don't have their up-to-date email address, uh, or we could have some other blockage in the system, firewalls and that type of thing. If you haven't received your email uh, with your UVC just yet, you should contact the Civil Service Division Help Desk. And that email address is cshelp at forsa.ie. So if you've got any issues, or if you've got any of your co-workers in the office who haven't received their UVC yet, they should have received it by now and they should contact cshelp at forsa.ie. The process to vote is simple. Once you get the email, copy your UVC from the email and paste it into the box on our independent ballot platform hosted by My Voice. My Voice collect our votes, and the count then at the end will be ratified by a scrutineer appointed by our national executive when the ballot closes on the 15th of March at 12 o'clock. Now, I just want to make a quick point before I finish that the number of workers joining FORSA doubles when we have these ballots. And that's because it's only FORSA members who can vote on the proposition. And they have until Friday the 15th of March at noon. I'm saying it again. Friday the 15th of March is the next key deadline at noon when all the votes have to be cast. And if there are colleagues that you work alongside with who haven't joined the union yet, they need to join the union now. I'd ask everyone, as well as asking people, have they voted yet? Everyone on this call, ask your co-workers if they've joined the union yet. This ballot is a great opportunity for us to demonstrate our collective strength, right? So please take every opportunity you can to help us mobilize the vote, the biggest vote that we've had, and help us to grow the union, as well as voting yourself, of course, if you haven't already done it. So again, any issues that you might encounter, please don't hesitate to contact the Civil Service Division Help Desk on cshelp at forza.ie. Molly Bukas, Anna. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, we'll be finishing up now, and many thanks for all the participants. If we didn't get to your question or you feel that um, you have additional questions, um, do send them in as well to the help desk there. That's cshelp at forza.ie, and we will endeavour to get back to you as soon as possible. But again, the ballot is open. The ballot is live. You would have received your unique voter code to be able to vote. You need to encourage your colleagues and those working alongside you to vote. The more people who vote, the stronger our voice is um, and voting will be going on until that Friday just before Paddy's weekend so we'll close out there and thank you everyone for joining us thanks Una thanks everyone yeah.